Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome uh, from the University of Melbourne to our transport webinar. It's uh, early, just turned afternoon on the east coast of Australia, so we welcome you all. Thank you for coming. Our topic today is automation of traffic. Are we closer than we think with AI? Um, so hope you're all in the right place and ready to go. We've got a really good uh, number of registrations for this event. Great panel. So we, we look forward to it. Um, we've got to 1.15, so uh, we've got a lot to pack in. So we're going to move quickly. My name is Peter Sweatman. I'm the Enterprise Professor in Transport at the University of Melbourne, working with Majid Savi. Um, and uh, I'm going to be your MC for the uh, discussion today. So thank you. Uh, I'd like to start today's event by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which I'm hosting this webinar, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past and present. I would just note that uh, this is an AIMS event, the AIMS testbed here in Melbourne, and you can learn a lot more from our website, and that's probably how you uh, found out about this in the first place. Um, also that uh, today's event is being fil recorded, filmed, uh, or we put on the Faculty of Engineering and Information Technology or FEET webpage, so after the event, so thank you. Also, another great kind of outcome of this, or, or permanent record, will be a graphic created by Ray, our illustrator. So, Ray, are you there? Wonderful. So uh, Ray is going to be working away there to bring to life, visual life, what, what we're talking about. So we look forward to seeing what you capture. Um, so let's move in pretty quickly. Um, automation of traffic. You know, we hear a lot about automation of vehicles and, um, you know, that's not really our topic today. What, what about the other side of the coin? And how would we get aut automated vehicles are, basically single vehicles at the moment. They're automated so they don't, cra <clears throat> don't crash into other vehicles, but that doesn't say a whole lot about the traffic. And so what we want to focus on today is the automation of traffic, uh, optimization of traffic, and so on, and, and the extent to which artificial intelligence is going to be a game changer there. Um, we've seen over the past few years that a lot of advances, and we keep hearing about them on the vehicle side, and uh, we want to hear about some of the exciting things that are happening on the infrastructure side as well. Uh, this gives us a chance today. And really, um, we've already seen some early applications of AI here in traffic land in Melbourne, um, and some of the folks involved in that are on our panel today. So. Uh, there's a lot of interest in that work. So, and that can be done using existing data streams. So we don't need to wait necessarily. Um, we're going to be touching on safety, obviously. We expect that to, especially as we have more automation of the vehicles, um, everything's going to be a lot safer. But what about traffic efficiency, avoidance of congestion? Uh, we need that operational intelligence. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us today. You're welcome to interact, and we want a, uh, a, a vigorous interaction with everybody out there. And so you've got a Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, so, And we've already got a few questions in there, great questions. So let's have a few more. And um, um, so we appreciate that. And you can kind of interact with the questions you can like questions and so on on the right. So have a have a little explore with that uh, as we get started here. Uh, so we're going to start with our introducing our panel, and it really is a great group. Um, first up, I'm going to I'm going to welcome to the stage or the screen, um, stage and screen, is Dale Andrea, uh, Chief of Transport and Di Digital Technology for the Victorian Department of Transport. Dale? Hi, everyone. Thanks, Peter. So my division in the department delivers the technology that moves Victorians, and 
that statement about move uh, has has multiple meetings for us. It's not just about the systems that keep the network moving. It's also about how do we design for our customers? How do we deliver the experiences that they want? And how do we give them the, the travel choices um, that are easy for them? But we also want to be really inclusive around that. We don't leave people behind. So an AI is going to be a huge part of our function moving forward um, and supporting customers and the network to be efficient. So. Looking forward to sharing some perspectives today from the front line of transport. Thanks, Dale. We look forward to that. Um, now I'd like to welcome to the stage Susan Harris. Susan is well known to many here and around the world. She's the Chief Executive Officer of ITS Australia. Susan? Thanks very much, Thanks, Peter. Look, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. Um, ITS Australia are the peak body for advanced transport technology and we've been working with industry, government and academia in Australia and internationally for over 25 years to, to shape future transport. Um, I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. It's certainly very on topic. We've seen um, very much the focus in Australia move from a um, excitement about connected vehicles, excitement about automated vehicles and now very much the focus is on big data and how do we manage traffic overall and ease, you know, look at leveraging data to, to get us where we need to be. Um, so I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, thanks, Susan. Welcome indeed. Um, now I'm going to bring up uh, Craig Lawton. He's the principal IoT and cloud architect for Amazon Web Services. Craig, welcome. Hi, Peter. It's a ple pleasure to be here today uh, to join this panel. Uh, we've had the, the joy of working with the Ames Project for the last couple of years. Um, Amazon Web Services is a cloud computing uh, company, and we've got over 200 services now in all areas of IoT and analytics and machine learning. So it's a natural fit that uh, we work very closely with um, transport agencies, both here in Victoria and across Australia. And and globally, uh, and uh, significantly, we've joined uh, ITS Australia as well as uh, supporting AIMS. We look forward to the discussion today and, and the solutions we're going to build over the next few years. Thanks, Craig. Great to have you here. And uh, uh, it's really underpinning a lot of exciting developments, no doubt about that. Um, gives me great pleasure to now introduce Omid Edomai. He's the founding CEO of Peak Hour Urban Technologies. A good afternoon to you, Peter, my fellow panelists, and all your viewers, all our viewers. Umidesh Damai here with uh, Peak Hour Urban Technologies. We are a, an organization with a group of people with different technical background and from different disciplines, including artificial intelligence, software engineering, and, and traffic engineering focused really on creating disruptive and innovative technologies for smart cities and large cities, I would say. Uh, as you know, we have already deployed our solution here in Melbourne, and we are about to deploy that in another uh, major Asia-Pacific city, which hopefully I'm going to be able to announce in a few weeks. Uh, but for now, very happy to be here today and looking forward to our discussions and, and exchange. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks, Armand. Great to have you here. And, you know, you've, uh, you know, where the rubber meets the road on this. So it's great to have you. And uh, last but not least, my compatriot Majid Sabi. He's a director of AIMS, um, professor at the, in the Department of Infrastructure in the University of Melbourne. Majid. Hi, Peter. Um, um, and uh, good afternoon to everyone uh, listening to this um, very exciting uh, topic. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about this. Uh, this topic is very close to what I do um, as a researcher and uh, looking forward to uh, discuss it, you know, what is possible. Oh, that was quick. All right, thank Are you still, sorry, you might've dropped out, Majid. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be here and uh, discussing this topic with uh, with you guys. Okay, thank you. Wow, we're, I think we're running ahead of schedule. Amazing, thank you. So let's turn to the, the real discussion here, and we're going to get everybody on stage. Um, and 
I, I'm going to kick off. I'm going to direct a few questions initially, but even though I'm maybe starting off with one of the panelists, I'd like the others to uh, interject as required and, and let's have a conversation. So I'm going to start off with Omid because, as I said, the rubber meets the road in the sort of projects that, that he's, he's bringing something to the table here. So would you perhaps bring us up to speed a little bit on what recent insights for traffic operation have uh, been learned in Melbourne, particularly through the use of AI data extraction? Yeah, thanks, Peter. As, as you know, and many of our viewers know, we have uh, deployed uh, our solution in Melbourne, real-time uh, traffic prediction solution. Earlier this year, in May, I believe, was deployed. And this system has been up and running since then. Uh, we are ingesting large amount of data uh, in real-time. Uh, for example, 20,000 uh, speed data at different locations uh, and, and at 10,000 locations we are ingesting volume data from loop detectors, gas loop detector, making sense of the data and predicting in, in real time. And by the way, all of that in less than 30 seconds. Um, one of the insights, I would say significant insights, is was that uh, actually doing that using an entirely data-driven and uh, artificial intelligence approach is actually possible. Melbourne, as, you, as we know, is a large city. We are doing that with for tens of thousands of road segments. And until we did it, it wasn't actually quite obvious that it is actually possible. And as such, Melbourne is uh, world's first city where this, such a solution has been deployed. Uh, the second significant approach, uh, uh, insight, I would say, is that, as you know, we have been going in and out of uh, lockdowns in the last three, four months in Melbourne. And as such, the traffic patterns drastically change. Um, we have not made any changes. We have not done any changes to, to our system in the, in the, since it has been deployed, meaning that the system is able to automatically learn and adjust to the new traffic patterns and that is that is quite significant so it's an entirely maintenance free and an intervention free system that has been running um, we are now at the point that we we are able to actually add features where we can predict traffic much longer ahead of time, two or three months ahead of time. We are adding this feature very shortly to our system. And as such, we are actually able to analyze and also predict abnormalities in every road segments. As I said, there are tens of thousands of road segments that we are predicting traffic for. We are able to predict uh, abnormalities. Now, if you imagine that we can, for example, add crash data to this, we are going to be able to potentially determine and predict uh, crash sites and potentially even the timing of it, which is from a safety perspective, very, very interesting. Now, clearly we are standing uh, at the beginning of a very exciting journey with AI and the capabilities. I would say AI and, what, uh, and prediction of traffic is a starting point for many interesting um, traffic management and optimization strategies, including signal optimization, also safety optimizations. Um, very, very exciting. I know um, Majid has been involved in this. Majid, do you have any anything, any comments about the, the next steps? I mean, it seems to be a huge opportunity. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, it's a huge opportunity, Peter. I mean, a few years ago, you couldn't imagine this. Um, and I think that's the promise of AI. You know, if you have uh, uh, lots of uh, data that uh, you would like to uh, understand uh, what they do, and then you have enough uh, computation power and right uh, sort of you know technology, you can um, address some of this uh, unknown phenomena in traffic and transport. I remember uh, pretty much when I was doing my PhD, uh, probably about 20 years ago, and we were trying to understand how we can predict. Uh, you know, uh, traffic volume on freeways in Japan, uh, which is uh, compared to what Omid is doing is, is much, much uh, simpler uh, problem. 
and it was so difficult. Uh, we couldn't do it, um, you know, with the existing methodology back then, you know, the accuracy was uh, uh, very bad. But today we're talking about a city with, you know, over 10,000, 20,000 links. And in a span of two, three weeks, you can predict up to a few months with that accuracy is quite mind blowing. And that shows the promise of AI. And, I, and I'm looking forward to, um, you know, bring this to uh, more a multimodal prediction and, and that's the foundation for system management that we're all dreaming of, you know, when we can do this uh, in, in a system-wide approach. And I think this is a very strong and important step to the right direction. Yeah, thanks, Majid. And of course, in order to implement this technology <clears throat> in an institutional setting and in an organization like the Victorian Department of Transport, um, many, many challenges, obviously, because you've got a lot of stuff uh, business as usual to keep going while you're trying to innovate. It's not easy. And so I was going to ask Dale about that. We've got the ideal person here to, to reflect on that. How, can, how do you do that when you've got everything going on out there all, all day, every day? Um, so what are those challenges and how do you address them? Yeah, you're right, Peter. There's, there's certainly plenty of challenges, but Having worked closely with uh, Omid and the AIMS team, it's it's more clear to me than ever that the biggest challenge is not the technology and it's and it's not the data. I absolutely recognise that there's you know a long pathway of improvement and maturity of that capability that's required, but um, and that shouldn't hold us back at this point in time. The biggest challenge is here, I think, really around uh, that space of you know, having the having a, the right vision, um, building trust around the technology and how it how it can be delivered. Um, but there's also the big change program that's required to, to implement it. Um, what we're talking about here is a huge technology adoption challenge, and it's and it's really on on steroids because of the wide ranging you know, impacts that this is that this is going to have. You know, I, I think about this around you know the impacts it'll have in terms of the way we engage with customers, the way we manage assets, the way we respond to incidents. Uh, there's service changes that will be driven by AI. There will be, um, obviously, we're talking about you know, signaling today and, and, and traffic management. If you, if you look at that use case, Victoria has been a, been a world leader in, in that space, particularly in terms of active management of, of freeways. We have still a, a fantastic capability uh, in the department. And it's, it's not a, a simple situation where you can say to a group that's uh, delivered amazing uh, outcomes over an extended period that, uh, you know, thanks to your excellence over 30 years, but we're going to replace it with AI. It's just not the approach that you can take. Um, we need to be thinking about this differently around how you do implement, you implement in, in the appropriate ways. So um, you also overlay, you know, the reticence of, of government to invest in technology where they see it as, as high risk and it doesn't necessarily have the, the ribbon cutting. Um, that other other programs have. So I think we're really talking about having you know, leadership as part of that um, part of that solution, leadership that understands both the technology but also what the change is that's required. Um, partnerships is you know, obviously something we're touching on a lot today. Um, and we you know, we see that in the department we see partnerships as being absolutely critical um, in demonstrating the the cases and understanding the the applications nationally and overseas. Um, and, and we see the way that we've worked with, with AIMS has been really critical because it helps to build up that trust when you're looking at a you know, really rigorous evaluation of technologies in real world and real time environments. Yeah, that's, that, that is building that trust. And so that's important for us. And the last part of this is really pathways, including humans. Um, we need to be able to find ways to include people in that, in that development and particularly that expertise that we do hold. You know, how do we apply human in the loop uh, approaches to improving that technology through, you know, leveraging the expertise that's available to us. Dad, you mentioned the, the, the customers. How much do they need to know about AI? Are they just going to uh, enjoy the benefits and it's kind of a seamless thing and it's behind the scenes or do they need to know something about it or be able to interact with it in some way? Uh, it, it depends on what use case you, you're referring to there, Peter. But I, I think, firstly, they need to have some trust in the in a system, any system that's going to you know, help prevent crashes, that's going to you know, give them advice around what they should be doing. There needs to be a level of trust. So there is something from that in terms of uh, the uh, interaction of customers. But when we're designing services directly for customers, 
um, they need to be involved in that design and the design needs to be um, accommodating of what their preferences are and designing for their experiences and, and evaluated um, on how effective that technology, that automation and in, in future the artificial intelligence that drives those preferences um, needs to be effective uh, for the people we're designing for. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well said. So um, I've got a question for Susan. I mean, Susan, at IT Australia, you've got uh, a great membership that covers a pretty big ecosystem here in this technology. Um, mm -hmm. And they're, they're all champing into bit to sell their products right here and now. So do you have some comments about uh, how we can start with the deployment of sensors complementary things, data and analytics that are going to make a difference now rather than be be regarded as some sort of massive transformation all at once. Yeah, sure, Peter. Look, I think one of the, the great things about um, using data to manage our traffic is that um, it lifts the bar for everyone. So it doesn't matter whether you're driving the latest vehicle with the latest um, safety features or whether you're in a 20-year-old car and, and that's what you've been driving for some time. Um, this improves things for everyone. It also gives the visibility to um, to look at different modes of transport and some policy levers for government to pull in those directions as well when we look at traffic being managed overall. Um, so I think some of our panellists have already really touched on the, the challenges that we face with, with technology. Um, it's high risk. We've had um, Nick Fowler at our most recent conference from Vic DOT talk about he felt... Um, at risk of being the emperor in his new clothes when he was investing um, in a new algorithm. Um, so these are the challenges in the technology space that we need to really try and overcome. Um, and AIMS is a great example, I think, of how industry can, um, in, in the real world, demonstrate this technology and take that risk factor out for, for government as they look to invest in this space. Um, so, and it's also a building block approach as well. It doesn't need to be everything at once, everything today. Um, but looking at demonstrating that technology, providing um, confidence um, for, for government and industry that this is real technology. We've heard already that um, we don't need to, we know the technology is there and we, we understand as industry insiders that, um, that this can work and do, do a great job. But it's the way we sell that, the clear messages and the demonstration of that technology to, to build that confidence. And I think providing that stepping stone approach um, to, to take on board the technology to really help um, help a, a firm pathway forward. So Susan, as we see on the vehicle side, you know, vehicle automation kind of taking longer than everyone said it was going to and so on. Um, are, we, are you hopeful that on the infrastructure side we can move a little faster and, uh, and, and get stuff done without having to wait for all that to play out? Yeah, look, absolutely. At ITS Australia, you know, we're working hard in the background with industry to unlock the benefits of automated vehicles, to bring together the benefits of connected vehicle technology so that we can have cars communicating with each other and communicating with infrastructure. But that's super complicated. Um, trying to get, you know, manufacturers to share data real with each other um, and to have that trust to share real time with infrastructure managers um, it's quite a pathway to move forward to, to get the best benefits from that. Um, so we're hopeful that we'll get there, but in the meantime, having sensors to detect what's happening in our traffic network and to manage that holistically just cuts across a whole lot of those challenges and enables us to move forward today um, with technology that's proven and exists and gives us those benefits today. Yeah, I think, Susan, I think that's a great message. So, Craig, I'm getting around to you and I'm thinking, um, you know, we, we're we seeing a proliferation of low-cost sensors, edge computing, 5G. Um, is it possible that transportation is becoming the low-hanging fruit of public-private AI somehow? I mean, we hear about other um, applications in healthcare and so on, and but is it is transportation in danger of becoming a kind of poster child for AI? Look, it's an interesting question. Uh, as, as we look at, you know, the IoT market and sensors and cameras, we see billions of um, devices being connected to networks. And we, we have a saying at uh, Amazon that if you could, um, if you could understand or measure the state of everything, what decisions could you make? And if you apply that to transport, 
if you apply that to the areas of congestion and safety, if you think about the economic impacts uh, that that would have on a state or a city, uh, is significant. So I think that that's why it's driving uh, a lot of interest. Uh, a, a project or an ecosystem like Ames allows uh, people to experiment uh, with with technology such as you know, lidar, radar, camera technology that can that can really um, gather more information from the physical environment so that you can make better decisions and that you can drive better artificial intelligence algorithms. So that's that's the exciting bit. And I think that uh, de-risks a lot of the, um, the these types of projects because you can start small and then you can you can validate the technology before you scale. So there isn't that huge upfront capital expenditure investment necessarily before you've proven the technology. And if you think about how startups started in the, the, the clouds. If you think about the Airbnbs of the world, they started small, they uh, iterated, and then they, um, they they managed to prove their concept and scale. And the challenge with transport is that it exists in the physical world as, as well. And you've got cars, you've got transport infrastructure. How do you bring that together? Um, when we look at IoT, um, we're looking at a lot of constrained devices that are constrained for connectivity. They might be in the outback or in the regions or they might be constrained, they might not have that much power. And that's where we think cloud computing uh, really disproportionately is important because you can do a lot of the processing with the uh, elastic uh, compute that's available in the cloud. So if you're out in the regions, perhaps you might be connecting using satellite or a technology like LoRaWAN through uh, AWS partner network and companies like Miriota or, or Meshed. If you're in the cities, you might be connecting with 5G in the, the future, and that allows you to do very low latency um, uh, uh, workloads. So it allows you to do things like uh, safety critical um, use cases where you need to respond in single milliseconds. And we've been um, uh, launched a service called Wavelength, which allows people and innovators and partners like Peak Hour, for example, to, to, to devise uh applications and solutions which can reside in the edge of 5g networks so you can start to take on these um mission critical workloads that's why we're excited mm -hmm. about that. the kinds of work we can do with um uh, organizations like its australia and also the aims project uh over over the next few years is going to be an explosion in innovation in this area great Craig, you, you mentioned iteration and it certainly iteration looms large in, in vehicle R&D and, and, and product launches and so on of new vehicle products. It seems that that's something that's a much harder to do maybe in infrastructure. And I'd be interested in Dale's comment on this and others, you know, where um, how easy or hard is it to try something out, learn from it, adjust it and, uh, and do you know do another one and another one when you've got procurement you know certain protocols that need to be followed um, in a public private kind of space so um, Dale I, I, I'd be interested in any comments on this from the panel but I might start with Dale iteration in infrastructure yeah, certainly, Peter. This is um, something that we've been really focused on over the last uh, probably twelve or eighteen months now is. How do we how do we get better at um, that experimentation and innovation? How do we find paths through to uh, you know trying and learning and, and failing if we have to? Um, yeah, that's often been a been a difficult thing for for governments to I guess um, take on board. But uh, we have established innovation capabilities within the department. We are um, looking at different models of how you procure those services through an innovation approach, where we we look at um, proof of concepts and um, and smaller trial implementations of things that you can do more rapidly um, to, to support that innovation. But I'd also say that's also where the AIMS testbed comes in for us. Um, you know, we, ha we have a partnership with AIMS. We can uh, look at those technologies within a, within a testbed that's a, that's a fantastic, um, you know, rigorous testing of, of new technology. So that's another way in which um, we find is really important that allows us to you know, get hands on with the technology and learn a lot about it by through that partnership, but uh, there's plenty of other ways that we're we're trying to you know continue to iterate um, and innovate um, in in the department, and we'll be doing more of that in the future. Thank Peter. I would yeah, like to also add a few things. Um, I think when we're doing uh, this AI prediction with uh, Peak Hour Technology uh, as Melbourne University, our job was to confirm that the accuracy of 
prediction. So we, we look at this over six months. As Omid said, this coming every 30 seconds, every two seconds, every one second data coming and you're predicting. So you have millions and millions of records of data against the predictions. So you kind of, I, I don't think even any, any car manufacturer can do this many times of uh, reputation and uh, sort of the benchmarking that we have done for AI. So we, we kind of um, look at the prediction over, you know, maybe one million records and justified, you know, the prediction, you know, with very high accuracy. So I think mm -hmm. in some um, sort of, you know, different perspective uh, with AI, you can do this um, in a much more rapid way uh, to uh, develop some uh, sort of, you know, benchmark against, uh, you know, what, what you'd like to um, uh, show to the public uh, in terms of real reliability, uh, accuracy, and so on and so forth. I think you raise an yeah. interesting point, if I may, um, Peter, Majid, around the, um, these are the decisions are being made or guided in the in the public's interest. You know, we've got public accountability through the traffic manager. Um, whereas when we look at other ways of um, you know automated vehicles or vehicle manufacturers, you know they're you know essentially accountable to their owners or to the driver of the vehicle um, and their customers. So um, I think we can you know if we're looking at trust and confidence in the system. Um, it's more likely to be there if we've got some sort of pathway to public accountability. So, Majid, uh, I was getting around to you, and um, by, by the way, I've heard a lot of nice things said about AIMS, so um, I'm sure you won't mind that. But the, um, so we've heard about data, you know, and, and, that, and the opportunity with data, and we already have data, and we'll get a lot more and the analytical side of it that's what's what's needed now to add to that to create a the next transportation management system that presumably is going to use ai what 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 is that management system what are the main imperatives around that i think i like what dale said i'm going to start from there when he said about mindset i think this is a one of the things you need to start top down you know, you're not going to buy a device, put them out, wait for 5G to come, this and that, and they say, oh, what, what am I going to do with all of this? So you need to start from top down and say, I have the traffic problem. It's not going to go away. It's getting worse. And I don't know what the hell I'm going to do with it because, by the way, we are spending 50 years in the past using existing methodology, you know, modeling and all of that that's not going to work. Um, and it's not, it's not getting us anywhere. So... I would like, for example, to shave 5% of my traffic congestion and enhancing the safety um, with AI. So what, what are the requirements? We know that we have enough data. Of course, we're going to benefit from having more you know, specific data. For example, you know, if we know what are the direction of movements or you know, um, those kind of very detailed information at intersections or some of the intersections, that's going to be very useful for sure. So we're adding this a little bit more specific data to the mix. And then, you know, we need to develop, um, you know, sophisticated and tailored AI for transport. It's not any AI. Um, uh, for example, you know, you can talk to Craig. He can go and get the top 100 machine learning uh, techniques and deploy them to uh, what Omid has done and probably not going to get even half way close to what he can predict. So you need tailored AI for, for transport. And I think if we start with that vision, we can, we can pull it together and we can do a multimodal management of transport system using AI that there is no hope, there is no way with existing technology, with existing practice, we can get even close to it. And, and 50 years history of failing is a big, big sort of, you know, beacon in front of us telling us we need to change gear and we need to do something different. Yeah, yeah thanks. Yeah, if I may echo Majid's comments, um, uh, you know, one of, one of the things that may not be as obvious what we are doing is that we are not just consumer of, of data. We are actually analyzing data and, and making sense of it. You, you would not believe how much data there is out there that, uh, that is not the quality is not good enough to actually be, you know, to consume in any form and shape. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's really important to analyze the data and understand the data. And as Majid said, this is not just a purely uh, machine learning exercise, AI exercise. So uh, as I said at the outset, you know, we have people 
uh, with different technical background. We have people who understand machine learning, but also traffic engineering. So because you need to look at this data from a traffic perspective and really, really understand that. Uh, I, I believe if you look at any other industry, one of the complexities that you have is about integration and in particular integration of, of data. This is not just in transport, in any industry across, uh, across, you know, across the board uh, and, and not location or geography or any, any particular domain. Data is really important to understand. And I think that's part of the responsibility that comes also with government in terms of creating the policies to allow the industry to understand, uh, to, to uh, be able to actually consume the data with the standard and with the, with, the, uh, with, with the quality that we can better understand, better uh, use and, and better utilize for various different applications that we need to do. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'd like to add to that, I mean, that when you're using these AIs in context um, and you're using an agile approach, you're using an incremental approach, what you also understand is where are your data limitations? Where are, what data can you apply to actually advance this technology? Where do you need to invest your time? If you know where, where the future is heading with some of this uh, capability and you can see that it's working and you want to take it to the next level, um, it's through that trial that you actually get the better, the, the best insights around how to um, to invest in it. Um, so. I think that's absolutely critical. You know, Department of Transport's investing in you know, digital twin, um, you know, situational awareness tools to, to help with that. But AI is going to be a, a huge part of that into the future. Uh, I know other jurisdictions are doing some similar things as well. But um, you know, we need to start moving in that, that space um, to understand what we need to do with that situational reality tool and how to build up that uh, that digital twin in the most effective way that will support the best implementation of AI. Yeah, thanks, Dale. Um, now I'm going to throw another question at you. We're starting to get so we've got a pretty erudite audience out there, and they're starting to throw in some pretty good questions. So I'm going to go to a few of those. And um, the question is: Will uh, VDOT make SCATS data open to the public with an API anytime soon? Yeah, so we do have some SCATS data um, already going out um, through an open API. Um, there are organizations also consuming you know, the real-time data source as well. Um, but obviously that has some challenges with it in terms of um, the infrastructure that we need to, to build to make that available to everybody. Uh, so yes, we've got, a, we've got a fairly significant plan on how we deliver a range of uh, new open data sources um, that will uh, you know, aid industry in its development of, of new products and, and innovation. So it's a huge part of our strategy is to make as much data available as possible. Um, we will be prioritizing that, of course, because it does uh, require investment. But um, yes, it, it will be uh, available uh, in time. Yeah, thanks, Dale. And actually, when I look at the questions coming in, there's quite a few that refer to SCATs, uh, particularly related to um, Upgrading of the SCATS algorithm using AI, is that something that's on the cards? And related questions and, you know, specifically what does CITS add to SCATS? So I want to maybe throw that one to uh, the panel and Dale, if you, you can start if you like, or I can throw it somewhere else to start. Yeah, I don't specifically have an answer to uh, to SCATS. We're um, you know, largely you know, delivered out in New South Wales, but um, uh, yeah, we know that you know, advancement in that is, is being looked at all the time and, and no doubt that, uh, that AI is, is, a, is a part of that. Yeah, look, I can share that I know um, Transport for New South Wales are investing significantly in the upgrade of SCATS at the moment. Um, and so that's, you know, we probably don't have a SCATS person in the room to give us details on that, but, you know, certainly they're, they're looking to make sure that it moves forward and continues to add value as the transport ecosystem evolves. Thanks, Susan. And I think um, okay. you know, I could add something just just in general, you know, for, for systems like SCATs or streams, um, at, at its core, they're uh, 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 compute, if you like, a computer that's out in the intersection. Um, and uh, the, um, the, I suppose, the emergence of edge computing allows you to do things like 
um, learn from the data sets using uh, uh, ecosystems like AIMS and select peak hour. But then as you learn from the data, you can invest more in sensors and more in the edge compute, but you can also deploy a lot of the decision making out to, to, to the edge because you can use cloud computing uh, to uh, build and train machine learning models. Perhaps you might use a reinforcement model to, to look at how an intersection performs and what the timing of the signal should be based on the current load. And then you've designed that in the cloud, you can deploy that to run out in the physical edge, out in the transport infrastructure. And that gives you, uh, in, you know, the, the technology, the technical capability to adapt, um, say, signaling in real time. The implementation, of course, uh, is, is another thing, but the, the technical capability is there. And that's, that's very exciting, especially for people who don't like red lights. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think Peter, I, I'd like to say a few words about, and I'm not talking about the scale, I'm talking about general, I'm speaking about the, you know, signal management, network management uh, uh, all around the world. And uh, I like to use this analogy, you know, it's like you telling me, um, uh, is it possible to bring a Nokia, you know, uh, 1965 and make it like a, uh, you know, Apple that, the thing that we have today? Is it possible? I say, no, it's not possible. Sometimes you need to break things to make it better. And and I think why not? Because as long as you're going to look at the intersection, the way that those kind of systems looking at them, the way they're collecting the information and not looking outside the box is not going to be possible. At best, you have some incremental improvement. If you want an order of magnitude change, then you need to think outside the box. And you need to say, as I mentioned you know, previously, my top vision is to reduce traffic by 10% how AI can help me and then design downward and, and understand what hardware going to support it, not the other way around. This is the hardware. Let's add a bit of edge computing, a bit of 5G. Uh, are we going to be there or not? I think that's that's going to work probably a little bit. But if you want a big change, start from top and then see what hardware can, can support it, you know, what, what, what system can support it, not the other way around. Just give you one example. You know, we use AI to optimize signal control compare it with existing system across the whole whole world, not just a scan. We can we can reduce the congestion 20 to 25% today with AI. Uh, why? Because then we use different detection, we use different location for detection and different sort of you know data that we need. If you have all of them together, then you can bring down 25%. But if you just tell me you're gonna collect the information at the signal you're gonna do this and that. You are com you know confined to these requirements. I can probably reduce it by two percent. So that's where you're gonna go if you stick to system like a SCAD and just wanna try to you know incrementally improve them. That's I think is a, is a wrong wrong direction. Well, that's a very forthright very forthright comment, and I think it kind of goes back to my question to Dale earlier about how do you innovate when day to day you've just got so much to get done um, and it's a continuous demand how, how do you innovate so i mean is it going to take no scats fridays or something you know where we do something different on fri friday <laughs> i don't know but um that is uh how do we how do we deal with that problem i think it is a problem yeah it, it's always a challenge i know um there's so much um, operational work that's been done all the time and our uh, requirement to be responsive to situations on the ground um, is huge. But I think the, the opportunity comes where if we've got a capability that's being innovated, how do you apply it to that situation? Can you try it um, and see whether it will deliver a benefit? So uh, one of the thing, one of the areas we're looking to leverage the um, peak hour urban uh, AI technology is can we support our signal engineers um, in making uh, yeah, real-time uh, traffic management decisions um, by having that future prediction that sits in front of them? Is it is it better than the current you know, prediction models that they have in place at the moment? And, and undoubtedly it will be. Um, so if we can give them the tools that help them to respond to those operational challenges, then they're obviously more likely to be taken up. Um, but it is a mindset thing. It's certainly an organisational culture thing as well about um, you know, supporting our people to, to move into the, 
um, an innovation space and making sure that they've got some time um, that is supported um, to, to spend on those activities um, so that we can keep moving um, as opposed to keep responding. Thanks, Dale. Thank you. Um, we've got another great question coming in here from our audience. And, and this one, I think, um, I might in the first instance direct towards Majid. And this is really kind of a vision thing about future ecosystems comprising multiple automated vehicles, cloud traffic management systems, process. How, how does AI get processed in real time? with continuous exchange of data how does that is is that what's going to happen yeah i mean that's a great question you know we everybody pretty much uh, agreeing that the challenge is going to be moving from today to uh, where we have i you know systems that they, they're much uh, smarter you know we have uh, autonomous vehicle everywhere and things like that but but transitioning from here to there is going to be the challenge i think one of the one of the vision we had for aims was allowing us to experience this stuff uh, in a, a workable uh, manner um, and getting there so i think i think uh, when it comes to that question directly about you know is it possible to use ai on on, on the fly and, and working with things that are moving dynamically i think i think is yes uh, we're seeing uh, you know some of those technology coming forward you know uh, craig mentioned about you know the de uh, deployment of uh, cloud computing using 5g to the edge so those kind of um, initiatives uh, allow us to um, uh, basically, you know, bring AI to the uh, you know front and being able to use it um, in a dynamic way. I know that the peak hour technology is kind of doing that just for prediction. Um, but as I said, you know, if we can deploy this to wider range of um, uh, sort of you know applications uh, such as uh, you know public transport, uh, you know, vulnerable road users and hopefully uh, very soon to the management of the entire system including freight and everything else then if you have you know some of the some of the element of the transport more data driven uh, and providing more data such as you know uh, connected vehicles uh, then you can absorb those those information to your benefit and, and and i'd like to also stitch it back to my comment about about signal control that's exactly where it's it gonna matter you know, is your existing system can really do this stuff and can, can handle it. Um, and if not, the, the sooner you can move toward, uh, you know, I need to drop it and, and think something completely different, uh, you're going to be better off. Uh, because otherwise, you keep keep doing something that is not going to uh, provide significant benefit. And I think all of this is very important to uh, to be considered as a, as a, as a uh, uh, you know, framework uh, or, or architect when, when you start talking about technology and transport. So Majid, while, while you're there, um, so a very interesting question here about um, from the point of view of the innovator or business person, and I'm sure Omid could reflect on this too, um, to try out options, to try things out, stimulate change and improvement. Um, how can the AI systems themselves provide opportunities for companies, innovators to do that? Is that, I mean, it's one thing to have a physical test bed, I guess, but is there some uh, way that AI can be facilitated for innovators? Yeah, I think, I think, I think we, we are very lucky to be in Melbourne because we have so much uh, good data uh, coming, um, you know, uh, to the public. Uh, you know, Dale mentioned about the SCAD, the SCAD data is available. Uh, not maybe live, but with a day or two delay, you can get it. Um, we have so much data out by government that is is a is a, is a must um, for for anybody who would like to uh, work on AI. And I think this is a very good facilitator. Uh, but but I think if we can also uh, move toward uh, adoption of some of this technology in a safe manner, I think we're going to be creating even more um, possibility for everybody. But but um, I can pass it to uh, Omid or others that would like to make a comment. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Omid might comment on that, but I've got a question for Omid too while he's at it. Um, the question is, which data sources other than SCATs are currently used to predict traffic in Melbourne? Yeah, thanks, Peter. Uh, just to say a few words about what Majid said, absolutely, um, AI can, can facilitate 
uh, obviously we need data. Data is key. And uh, yes, we are lucky in Melbourne that we have access to some uh, data, in particular SCADs, through what uh, DOT is providing. But also, I would say uh, test beds like uh, Mel uh, not, uh, Ames and what Melbourne University has put together is really critical for us to collaborate. It's all about collaboration, being able to work together uh, with uh, uh, um, governments, but also with universities to, to innovate and disrupt. The disruption is the key word, doing things differently than it has been done before. Um, in terms of data, we are obviously using volume data, uh, SCATs in, in Melbourne, but in other cities, we are using volume data that is coming through uh, uh, cameras, for example. Uh, we are also using speed. Speed is critical for us. Uh, in Melbourne, we are working with TomTom Tom data, uh, providing very accurate data to us, real-time data. Uh, but also, again, in other cities, we are working with different technology providers and, and camera providers uh, giving us data. There is no limit in what kind of data we can use. I'll give you a few examples. We are experimenting with weather information, for example, and we find it that it influences uh, traffic and traffic condition in some cities more than others. Uh, but it's a very good source of data for us, combining, augmenting what, uh, what, other, what else we are using. But also from a safety perspective, as, as I talked before and touched on it before, uh, crash information, uh, incident data is absolutely critical for us in order to be able to predict abnormalities and, and potential crashes to help prevent them, obviously, in future. Mm -hmm. Just Thank adding you. to that, I, I mean, we've um, we have in the department trialed some um, some use of AI in uh, in crash prediction as well. We're working with Data for Democracy on that, and um, and that was looking really really promising in terms of you know, data that we're putting in, road geometry, speeds, a range of other things that is allowing us to identify you know those areas that uh, we thought were going to be going to be high risk, and we're able to build up a risk map um, across our network now. Uh, we haven't taken that further, but we, since then, you know, obviously there's new data sources becoming available and, you know, recently seeing data sources, you know, coming directly from vehicles and, and you look at the, uh, you know, acceleration forces and things like that that are that are being driven off vehicles. You can see how those models can very quickly uh, learn from that technology, learn from that data source and the technology will, will take us to the next level and being able to predict those crashes. So absolutely support that. We're already seeing some, um, you know, some examples of how that could work. Um, and, and I think it's yeah, very, very promising. Yeah, thanks, Dale. Um, got a question here that's really uh, quite thoughtful and a somewhat different type of question. And it's something I'd written down here. I'd written down trust. And I think maybe Dale mentioned it, so I might give him an opportunity to start. But the question is, trust sounds like it's a critical part of, of the development and implementation of AI. How do you define trust? Yeah, trust is um, one of those things that's hard to uh, hard to build and easy to lose. Um, so, obviously, with you, know, you can have trust with the operators. Um, so, if you've got operators of technology, how much do they trust it? How much are they willing to rely on it? Uh, you trust in terms of the willingness to invest in that technology because you believe in it. You know it's going to deliver the right outcomes. Um, there's trust for, for customers as well to, that they know that uh, what you're working on will be um, accurate and effective and you know, in their best interests. So I think there's a range of areas where trust um, can play out. But I think, I think Susan's got a really good example of this as well. So I might hand over to, to Susan to talk about some of that. Yeah, thanks, Dale. I think the observation that it's easily lost is um, something we need to be mindful of because once you um, lose that trust, if you deploy a technology that's not quite mature, um, it's really challenging to bring people back on board um, and to get people confident in, in um, relying on those predictions or relying on the directions that they're being given. Um, but I think like building on that next step from trust or in a, in a aligned area, um, we're also starting to explore a bit more the, the idea of... Um, 
of exchange of value when we look to share da sharing data. So this is when we're looking at getting access to in-vehicle data. Uh, are people willing to share that data and under what circumstances would they be willing to share data? Um, and looking at that idea of a value exchange. So we, we're all familiar with the idea that, you know, you download your maps, um, maps on your phone, um, you'll get access to that sort of up-to-date information, um, but you're going to be sharing typically the um, information about where you are in your position. Um, so that's a value exchange that many of us are willing to, to accept that, you know, what we get is and, and what we share out. Um, so at ITS Australia, we're, gonna, we're starting to look at some research that unpicks a bit more of that concept of value exchange when it comes to transport data. Um, so what sort of information are people willing to share or what do they want to get back to, to share that valuable data? So I think particularly as we start to look at individuals um, sharing data around from their vehicles, um, that becomes really important to understand. Susan, can you just delve into value exchange a little more? What kind of, what, what sort of things are included in that? Yeah, so that's what we want to understand is, you know, if you want to get safety alerts, um, for example, um, as a maybe a vulnerable road user, are you then also willing to share out data about your position and your status and your heading? Um, so that would be an example of, of a value exchange that you would get something um, to you, but you've got to share something back out into the ecosystem as well. And that's inherently builds on the back of trust, I guess, that your, your data is being shared appropriately, um, that it's de-identified as appropriately and being used in the manner to which you anticipate it's going to be shared. Um, and as we get deeper into this data and we want more individualised data to, um, you know, we want it to be anonymised, but the more granular we get, the more <coughs> we're going to need to, um, to get access to more of that at an individual level. Yeah, I look forward to that, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, here's one that's tailor made for Omid. Absolutely. I think his mum might have sent this one in. How quickly can you retrain the machine learning models if there's a change in the road network? For example, a temporary road closure, or do you train for multiple scenarios? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. I, I would say, look, this is coming maybe from uh, uh, technologies that have been uh, developed in the past. There are some aspects to it. There is uh, a typical, you know, what if scenario uh, that that people want to try and see what happens if you close the road or or certain other scenarios. This is more of an offline exercise and planning exercise, and there are great tools, model and tools that are great for that, that can be used. Uh, I would say from an AI perspective, these things have to be done automatically. So we don't need to retrain our, our models. They, they learn uh, dynamically and automatically based on the data that comes in. So if a road is closed, there is no there is no data, there is no volume data coming from that location and the, mm -hmm. and the model picks it up right away and retrain itself. All of that has been uh, needs to be done automatically. That's the value that you get from AI. Mm -hmm. But also one one key question here is we need to be clear if for example, and a lot of these scenarios people want to run when there is there are accidents, for example, uh, there are many decisions that road operators want to do in person. Uh, for example, when it comes to safety, uh, no one is going to allow a system. And again, we don't want to exaggerate and say that an a system, AI based system is going to make all sorts of decisions. When it comes to safety, obviously a lot of these decisions need to be done by the operator on site and, and sensible decision. However, what AI does, it can automate the flow, any optimization that needs to be done, anything else, obviously the AI can do that based on the situation on the ground, based on the incoming data and autom automate that. Anyone else want to add to that one? If not, um, Omid, I think we've got another one that's... Uh, Oh, okay. Um, so what work's being done to deliver rich content messaging to personal devices from traffic activity and transport to commuters? So maybe with the customer side to it, maybe Dale would be a good one to tackle that one first. 
rich content messaging to commuters? Yeah, well, certainly um, it's been a focus um, in recent times. Um, the redevelopment of our public transport app had um, a range of new uh, rich content that was added into that. So so go check out the, uh, the PTV app. Um, but where we're talking about um, AI, one of the things we're looking at at the moment is uh, we've got the Vic Traffic app, which um, is in the in the public realm at the moment. It's been for a number of years. Um, it's getting a little bit old uh, in the tooth, and really needs to be looked at in terms of how it supports emergency management um, and a range of disruption activities. So, one of the things we're going to explore as part of that redevelopment is how do we leverage you know further AI-driven content um, into that into that app. So how do we use um, you know forward predictions such as um, being produced by um, by the recent uh, Ames project with uh, with Omid and Majid um, from Peak Hour um, Urban Technologies to to look at whether um, there is a a, a customised stream or a, a stream of information that can be driven by AI that um, that supports um, people look, wanting to look at their traffic. Um, but we also got to look at how do we provide information out to third parties because we're not the only provider of, of you know, digital content um, in this space um, to, to third parties. So uh, some of the things we've done recently is you know, providing new data feeds out to, to other providers, um, you know, mobile as a service providers. Uh, Google is one that we've obviously provided a lot of information to recently. They've provided them a lot of information around uh, passenger numbers on, on public transport. So... Uh, it's certainly a you know, strong um, focus for us to continue to enrich that experience of our customers through uh, better information, whether it's consumed on our digital channels um, or digital channels of the marketplace. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Anyone else? Yeah, maybe maybe a quick comment. You know, one of the one of very interesting application in in this regard could be, for example, uh, travel time estimation that are based on predictions as opposed to real-time information, uh, potentially could be much more accurate. Uh, we are talking to organizations who are managing, for example, ambulances. Uh, they would be very interested, they are interested in that technology, but also could apply to fire department or police, but also it can actually be passed on to general public and, and travel it. So that's a very useful information that anyone can use. Thanks, Ivan. Um, we've got we're getting into deep acronym here, and I'm not going to try to decipher this question too much. But I think it's getting to um, you know things that are going on in other states, which may not necessarily look like um, direct application of AI. There might be other approaches being, and you know some of it obviously is um, situation awareness and so on. So. Um, what what else is what other important approaches do we need to take into account alongside AI? Yeah, I think I think Peter, um, we a little bit touch, touched on this uh, from many many um, uh, perspective with uh, comments from Craig, Dale, Susan, Numid. Um, I think I think um, this is quite established uh, uh, for AI. Uh, you know what kind of ingredients you need um, in terms of getting the benefit out and then the applications you know there are many applications uh, mentioned about freight for example you know that's a great application uh, especially when it comes to last miles delivery stuff the dynamic of it the change of it that again classic methods are unable to adopt and unable to um, basically handle it. So we, we discuss about, I mean, Dale mentioned about mobility as service is a great example that AI can can help and can uh, can be um, in our uh, sort of, you know, uh, disposal. But but in the beginning, I also mentioned about, you know, we need to also look about, you know, maybe uh, what, it, what is in the horizon in the next four, five, ten years, you know, and if, if you're not, you know, starting with this smaller step today, there's no way we can take advantage of those greater uh, innovation that come with AI in the next five, 10 years. So I think it's also very important. You know, it's like, you know, you're closing your country uh, to 5G or 4G back, you know, seven, 10 years ago. I say, I'm going to stay with 3G. I'm not going to think about it. So unless you start having these baby steps today, you're not going to take advantage of those, you know, bigger 
uh, innovation coming our way. So I think I think we need to uh, start looking at all this innovation from different perspective, multimodality, uh, so on and so forth. So there are plenty of examples, uh, and and start working on them. You know uh, today. Yeah. Thanks, Majid. So out there, I know there's a lot of interest in automated vehicles and when you'll be able to buy or, or ride on automated vehicles. And I'm going to allow just a couple of minutes towards the end for the panel to give a quick response on that. But we'll try because of the nature of our conversation here being more on the infrastructure. I, I don't want to get we could talk about that subject all day. So but at this point, I'd like to turn a little bit It's sort of the notions come up or the issue has come up a few times. And that is the customer. I think Dale mentioned it first. And various um, classes of customer have been mentioned. Um, you know, the folks who run the traffic in the traffic control centers and so on. Um, the the other modes of, uh, of transport and so on, exchanging data, all the way to the actual uh, drivers, travelers uh, themselves. And um, so I'm just wondering, uh, even in the in the vehicle related context, at the moment we we uh, communicate with drivers through traffic signals and a few other things. But how will that need to change? And even being more conscious of who we're, which customers we're dealing with. I just saw this morning some research that showed that ADAS systems in vehicles are much more effective in avoiding crashes in people under 25 years old. Um, so we, you know, we think about this customer thing in a pretty monolithic way. We think of different groups, I guess, but I just wanted to give each of you a chance to reflect a little bit on how what AI is looking or actually addressing in the way of customers. And maybe we start with uh, Susan. Thanks, Peter. Look, um, I think it's really um, interesting. Obviously, we want to put customers centre, um, but understanding how they're interacting with the AI. And, you know, we really want to make it as seamless as possible for them. Um, and in many ways, you know, they don't necessarily want to understand that there's big algorithm behind them, but just to... Um, have the information they need to make the, you know, make the choices that are going to be efficient in their day um, and get them where they need to be. Um, so in terms of um, how much we need to take on board, you know, it's certainly different customers. Where there's a lot more work happening now to look at um, dealing with the ed edges of our, our customer spectrum, if you like. So we're, we're doing some work at ITS Australia looking at um, community transport and how we interface with those. I know Vic DOT have recently done a lot of work on their their apps to make them um, more user friendly to a wider portion of the community. Um, and I think that's really where the focus of the current times has been: is that we don't just need to deal with the mainstream, but we need to deal better with the edges of the community. Um, and if we can manage those those fringes and people with um with different or more extreme needs, then we're going to also cater for, for the bulk of people in the, in the middle of the, of the sector. Um, but in terms of how we use AI to, to cater for that, well, I guess it's understanding those broader needs in the community, um, but hopefully it can be communicated quite seamlessly, whether it's through uh, a HMI interface in the vehicle. It might be as simple as, as traffic lights informed by AI um, that respond accordingly, um, and so it's pretty seamless um, to the drivers in, in the vehicle. Um, I'm sure others have got other views on how that might work, that connection from AI back to, back to the consumer. What about Amazon. you, Craig? Why don't you go next? At Amazon, yeah, we have this saying that customers are wonderfully dissatisfied. And I think if we think about uh, the the average commuter or even we think about um, uh, all the different types of people that would use a transport, I, I can't I get to a point where they're going to say, you know, I'm happy with that traffic today or I'm, I'm <laughs> that was a perfect journey. I, I get the feeling that there's always going to be something to improve and um, digital software development and cloud computing allows the people who build these solutions to be really productive and, and um, create solutions and responses to this um, dissatisfaction that customers have 
in a real effective way. Um, and so, you know, when we're def, um, building our storefronts for amazon.com.au, you know, we're always looking at uh, our customers and, and, you know, they always want to have the best range. They want it delivered as quick as possible and they want the best price and they're never satisfied. So we're always trying to improve and <laughs> digital software and cloud computing allows you to do that in, in a way that um, uh, improves over time. Yeah, that's a great concept. Uh, Majid, customers, who, who are they? Yeah, I think I think customers are people using our transport system and they, they see us as a system, you know, not not fragmented. You know, this is now um, um, cycling mm -hmm. and then now public transport and, and private, so the, the whole system is important. And I think, you know, we, we, uh, we uh, uh, this kind of uh, innovation that we're talking about, they're going to be benefit for sure. Um, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, predicting what happened on the road in future uh, is, is great. I like to know uh, when I'm moving. Uh, so that's a very good sort of, you know, piece of information. When it comes to safety, you know, our, our transport system become increasingly more complex with different people doing different things. Uh, it's not just, you know, uh, you know, two or three types of uh, transport uh, that we used to have. Uh, people, you know, doing uh, walking, uh, cycling, you know, e-scootering, so many other things happening at the intersection and safety of those people and how to manage it become increasingly important and increasingly complex. Um, so again, if you can using this type of technology and assisting them, they're going to be the benefit, uh, you know, um, um, receiver of of these uh, innovations. And, and I love the stats out there that backing this um, sort of trend that um, even if, you know, for example, because of COVID, they have less traffic on road, but it still that doesn't translate itself to less injury and, uh, you know, uh, different type of issues. Uh, and we have to we have to be mindful about that and, and um, look forward to uh, provide these benefits to um, to those users. Thanks, Majid. Uh, just a quick one, Ahmed, if you wouldn't mind. We're running out of time. Yeah, Peter, if, if you don't mind, I would change hat and answer this question from a perspective of a customer and, and as a person, not not from a technology perspective. I know there are cities, large cities, that are creating what they call brains that to automate all aspects of transport and gathering all sorts of data and, and, and automating workflows. Uh, it is really important that we put people in the center of that. The idea is that we give people choices and the system reacts to people and people's choices as opposed to other way around. Also, it's very critical that from a private privacy perspective, we, may, we make sure that, uh, that people's privacy is is um, um, taken care of and we don't, I mean, if, if, we, if we know all movement of people, it's very easy to create this system, but we don't want to live in that society. So that is extremely important. That comes to ties into the question of trust that we earlier discussed, uh, discussed earlier. Yeah, it's a pretty important point, I mean, that if we want to throw privacy out the window, we could solve all these problems tomorrow. Yeah. We wouldn't need all the technology. Um, Dale, a final comment on customer, who the customers are here. Yeah, well, uh, the customers, you know, they're, all of the road users that are out there that um, use transport services in some form or another or rely on it, and that's just about everybody at some point, um, probably a little less at the moment. But the um, <laughs> for us, we need to, um, as a transport department, we need to judge ourselves by our customers' experience, and that takes time, effort, focus, and we need to make sure we're doing the research to understand whether we are in fact doing that. And it requires the capability around around CX, customer experience that allows us to design the right products. And in some cases, um, the products won't be delivered by uh, by government, they'll be delivered by, um, by private entities. But what we need to have is a seamless system that works across different modes, it works across different user groups, um, and it works across public and private, um, and it's seamless for the users. Yeah, that's a great message. Thanks, Dale. So I'm just gonna, wrap up and I, I just want to say that I wrote a couple of things down here. One word was iteration. We talked about that and how you do it in infrastructure. Uh, it's a, I think it's a good concept. I wrote down ingestion and I think Omid mentioned that ingestion of data. That's probably going to be enough to 
put barriers of entry up to so you're not going to have too much competition on it. I think that word would scare a lot of people. Um, trust, we talked about. Um, Majid said this is highly tailored AI for transport. Important to remember that. Um, many different data streams, and, and we were specific about a few of them, but we always come back to SCATs and we, we want to do better there. Um, Susan talked about the edges of the customer spectrum. I like that. Everyone was very nice to Ames, and obviously, to be serious, I mean, a lot of these issues are just tailor made for Ames. So, very good. And, and Craig told us that customers are never satisfied. So, um, <laughs> that makes us all feel, feel a lot better. Um, so, I want to thank you all. We are out of time. Um, I want to apologize to the folks who wanted to know when they could ride on an automated bus more than 500 meters. And um, you're going to have to get on our next webinar to get the answer to that. We're not even going to go into that. So on behalf of the Ames, Ames uh, platform, University of Melbourne, uh, I want to thank the panel for their contribution. They've been pretty good, I think. Um, so again, thank you, Dale, Susan, Craig, Omid, and Majid. Great synchronization. And thanks to our illustrator, Ray, of course. And thank you to all the audience for your questions. Apologies on the automated vehicle one. Um, it is an important issue and we wanted to give input infrastructure in the sun here for a little while. So we ha had a chance to do that. So thanks everybody involved. Um, stay safe and have a nice day. Thank you.